This is a 2004 Chevrolet SSR. It's a two-seat roadster. It's a pickup truck. It's a retro-styled convertible. It's really, really weird. Obviously, I'm going to show you around the SSR, because this wouldn't be a Doug DeMuro video without a tour of this thing's quirks, but folks, I think you'll agree, before we get to that, we have to discuss how this thing came to exist in the first place. Only, I have no idea how it came to exist. The SSR came out in 2003, and it was sold through 2006, only four model years. Now, in the early 2000s, General Motors wasn't doing much experimenting. They were mainly making bland sedans and bland minivans and bland SUVs that were way behind what the competition was already putting out. And in fact, they were only a few years away from bankruptcy, which came a little bit later with the economic collapse. They absolutely should not have devoted any resources to a retro-styled muscle car convertible pickup truck. And yet, and yet they did. The SSR debuted in 2003 with a 300 horsepower 5.3 liter V8 mated solely to a four-speed automatic transmission. And that powertrain continued through this, the 2004 model. Beginning in 2005, General Motors ditched the 5.3 in the SSR and they replaced it with a 390 horsepower 6 liter LS2 V8, a near 100 horsepower increase over the prior model year, which must have pissed off everyone who got an SSR in the first two years. Beginning in 2005, it was also the first year you could get an SSR with a six-speed manual transmission. But nobody really did. In fact, Chevrolet only sold 22,000 of these over the four model years, meaning that nobody really bought the SSR much at all. Probably because nobody was really in the market for a two-seat retro-styled convertible pickup truck, especially one with a base price of $41,000 in 2004, which translates to about $55,000 in today's money. Nonetheless, I've always wanted to check one of these out because it's just so unique, so unusual, so weird, so unlike anything else that was being made by General Motors at the time, or by anyone. So today I'm going to take you on a tour of this SSR, and I'm going to show you all of its weird quirks and its unusual features, and then I'm going to get it out on the road and find out how this thing drives, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the SSR experience, click the link below to go to autotrader.com oversteer. Now, I'm going to start in the back. I told you this was a pickup truck, and yet you can see it has a trunk, or a tonneau, as General Motors calls it. But it opens up, and if you look back here, you'll see that there's no keyhole. So how do you open it? Well, you push a button on the key fob, and then it pops right open automatically, delivering you to your cargo storage space. But obviously, it's difficult to lift things into the back from here. So you just get in here, pull on a little handle and then you're in the back. Now, when you're back here, you'll notice a couple of interesting things, one of which is the interior handle to open the tailgate. It is the exact same handle they use on the doors. So technically, this vehicle has two doors, but three door handles. But the most unusual thing back here is the process of closing the tonneau, or the large trunk. Now, you'd think if you just want to toss something in here, you could just open it up and then toss it in and close it. But that's not how this works. In fact, in order to close this, this has to be open. So opening it is easy. Just push the little button on the key fob and it pops open. But closing it, first you gotta do this, and then this, and then you can close it, which makes things a little bit challenging. It's a three-step process to close it, after only a one-step process to open it. That might sound confusing, but you won't be confused if you just look at the little warning label under the tonneau. It tells you exactly what you have to do. This isn't some process that SSR owners prefer because it preserves the rubber or something. This is something you actually have to do if you want to close the tonneau. Now, it may seem stupid to have a pickup truck with a pickup truck bed and a trunk over it, but this trunk can easily be removed. The owner tells me it takes only a few minutes, and it's a little bit cumbersome, but it's not really all that difficult. There's a couple of bolts at the front of it, and after that you just sort of pull it forward and lift it right out. And the owner has transported some things in this vehicle that would make it seem like an actual pickup truck, including a treadmill that wouldn't fit in the back of a big SUV. So technically the SSR really is a pickup truck. 
A couple of other interesting things about the giant rear trunk. Now, it is really a pickup bed back here. It's a complete one-piece unit. It's plastic. You can throw whatever you want back here. You can hose it out. And another interesting thing, like I showed you before, the easiest way to open the rear is with the key fob. Just push the button and it pops open. But that isn't the only way. There's no easily visible button in the interior to open the trunk, but there's a hidden one. Pop open the glove box and feel your hand around to the left and you will see that there is a little button there that allows you to open the tonneau in case you lose the key fob or you can't access it for whatever reason and you still want to get in back. But ultimately, in addition to being a pickup bed, this is also a trunk and so by federal law, it must have one of these little trunk releases. And so if someone ever tries to kidnap you and take you away in the back of a Chevy SSR, now you know how to get out. So I've already convinced you that this is a pickup truck, or at least it's a vehicle with a giant trunk, but I also told you that it was a convertible, and I'm going to prove that to you now. Now, in order to put the convertible top up or down, you press a little switch in the center console that has on it the silhouette of the SSR, which is a nice little touch. I think it looks kind of cool. You press that, and, well, you can watch the top go up. I know some of you enjoy doing that. Here goes. And now the top is in place, and when it looks like this, you can barely even tell that it's a convertible, especially in this dark color. You can't really see the seams in the top, and the owner tells me a lot of people don't even believe him that it's a convertible pickup until he presses the button again, and then... and then the top is down. Now there are a couple of interesting things about the top beyond just watching it go up and down. One of which is the trunk has to be completely closed in order for the top to go up and down because the little cover for the top otherwise might intersect the trunk. So it has to be closed or it can be off, which means that you can drive this car around hauling stuff in the back like a pickup truck and you can have your roof down like a convertible. You can't do that in anything else unless you have a 1980s Dodge Dakota convertible. The other interesting thing is is that the slot here where the top is stowed can also be used as storage if you need extra storage beyond the giant trunk. Just put the top back up and then stop the operation while the cover is up and you can stick stuff back there. But you gotta remember that you stuck stuff back there because otherwise when you put down the top, it'll hit the stuff and then all sorts of things will probably break. Next up, we move on to the rest of the SSR's quirks, which are also fairly plentiful, starting with the window switches. Now, the window switches are not mounted on the door like in virtually every other car. Instead, they're mounted in the middle, which isn't that weird, except for the fact that the traction control switch is mounted right next to the window switches, and it's the same size. So you might go to roll down your window and instead turn off the traction control, which is sort of an interesting place to put that. In addition, it's also next to the power lock switch. So the windows, the power lock switch, two things you use fairly frequently, and then the traction control, something you probably never really want to turn off. And speaking of interesting switches inside this car, I told you this thing had a $41,000 MSRP, so it's loaded. That means it has leather and it has heated seats, but the heated seat buttons, well, where are they? They're not in the middle next to the power windows and the traction control button. Instead, they're on the side of the seats. And when the doors are closed, good luck trying to reach your hand down there and turn on on the heated seats, assuming that you can even figure out which button on the side of the seat turns on the heated seats and which one are the seat controls. It's a very odd placement of the heated seat button. And moving on, I wouldn't do the SSR justice if I didn't talk about its automatic transmission gear selector, which is quite bizarre. It's mounted directly in front of the power window controls, and it's this little silver knob that sticks up from the middle. I think it's intended to replicate an old retro car shift knob, but it has a couple of interesting quirks, one of which is the fact that the button for it is on the top. So if you want to shift gears, you push the button down on the top, and then you shift into gear, but that's not the strangest part. The strangest part is the fact that the gears aren't labeled. Even though there's a rather large area around the base of the shifters where they could have put the gear labels, they didn't. So the only way to see what gear you're in is to look in the gauge cluster. While you're actually shifting, if you look down there, you're just sort of guessing where you are. 
Next up, you may have seen that little black thing next to the transmission lever. Well, that is the cup holder, the factory cup holder in this car. They didn't install one in the center console. Instead, it's this little plastic piece that sort of sticks out. And here's the other cool thing. It's removable. You can take it out if you don't want the cup holder to be stealing your valuable passenger leg room. You can just pull it out and get rid of it. Or you can mount it on the driver's side, which makes absolutely no sense because if you actually had a drink in there, it would completely block your ability to touch the brake pedal, let alone the accelerator pedal. It would be right in your way. It's hilarious that they have clips for it on both the passenger and driver's side, but for some reason, they do. Now, interestingly, there's also another cup holder in this car, also unseen. It's hidden in the dashboard. You push this little button, and then the cup holder retracts, and you can use it for your drinks. And next up, we have to talk about the seats, which are rather unusual. Now, they're pretty comfortable leather seats and from your angle, they probably look completely normal, but they have one very odd quirk about them. Namely, there are three ways you can move the backrest. There's a lever on the backrest that pulls it all the way forward in case you want to get to the non-existent back seats. Then there's another lever that pulls the backrest forward a little bit in case you want to get to the non-existent back seats less. And then there's the power control that moves the backrest forward also. So in other words, the backrest can be moved forward by three different things, which have three different functions, which is already weird, but it's especially weird on a car with only two seats and no back seats, so there's no real need to move the backrest forward at all. But there is one reason you might need to get behind the seats in the SSR. Now, there's nothing behind the passenger seat, but behind the driver's seat, there is a tire kit. It comes out and it contains a tire inflator and sealant in case you have a flat tire because this car has no spare. Normally, in a lot of the exotic cars I film with, behind the seats, there's storage, but not in this car, only that tire kit behind the driver's seat. However, there are a few interior storage items in this car. There are little tiny storage pockets on the door panels, and also there is a little glove box. And in the center of the SSR, there's this oddly shapen interior storage compartment where you can put some more stuff. And still more interesting SSR interior quirks. The top obviously is operated automatically, but if you need to manually operate it, you can lift it into place like in most convertibles, and then you have to tighten it down, and that is a rather unusual process. First, you have to take off this little cap. You take that off, and then there's a little mechanism, and in order to secure the top in place, if you're closing it manually, you have to use this tool. And it isn't just a regular screwdriver or an Allen wrench. Instead, they have this bizarre proprietary head on this thing, and that's the only way you can get it in place. And if you lose your little tool, good luck, because Chevrolet is not making any more of them. Another interesting interior quirk in the SSR is the climate control vents. This car obviously has climate control vents, like every car, but the interesting thing is that in this car, they're rather small, and they're vertical. I was kind of expecting them to be weird stylized circles or something, but no, they're these tiny little small rectangles. Now, I certainly wasn't expecting that, but I really wasn't expecting this next quirk. This car has four cigarette lighter power sockets, four of them even though it only has two seats. Now, there's one with the actual cigarette lighter. That comes out of a panel mounted below the climate controls. You expect that, but there's another cigarette lighter power socket in the passenger side footwell underneath the airbag. And there's another cigarette lighter power socket in the driver's side footwell underneath the gauge cluster. And then there's a final one in a place that, well, you wouldn't really expect. It's back here in the bed. You flip up this little thing and it reveals the last cigarette lighter power socket. Now, that's kind of a cool idea. Let's be honest, if you want to tailgate or play anything back here that requires power, you can do that with this. Chevy, maybe they were thinking when they created the back of this car. And since I'm back here, another interesting quirk behind the SSR would be the battery. It's not located under the hood like the battery and virtually everything else, and it's not in the trunk. Instead, it's beneath the trunk. The best way to describe where the battery is located is the passenger side exhaust pipe. It's basically right back here underneath the license plate, which is truly a terrible place for a battery. In order to change the battery in this car, you basically have to jack it up in the air. Fortunately, there is a jump point underneath the hood like in a normal car, so if the battery dies, you can jump it under the hood, and you don't have to jack it up just to jump start it. Next up, we have to talk logos. For being such an in-your-face bold design, this car is surprisingly short on logos. In fact, the only exterior SSR badge is right here on the back. There's none in the front, there's none on the sides, none on the doors. This isn't like a Focus RS where there's an RS badge at literally every flat surface and most curved ones. This is the only SSR badge on the outside of this car. There are a couple of other interesting logo placements, however. For example, the front reflector and the rear reflector have the Chevrolet logo in them, just a little Chevy 
heavy bow tie in front and in back. And maybe the craziest one, you will also find a Chevy bow tie on this little rubber part where the door links up to the rest of the car near your headrest. I've never seen anything like that. I don't know why they bothered to waste money putting a Chevy bow tie logo there, but once you notice that, it is kind of a cool little feature. I also like the fact that when you get in the SSR and start it, instead of playing a full color movie like a modern car, when you turn it on, it just uses the driver information center to say Chevrolet SSR in rather unassuming green print. Now I'm done with the quirks, but before I move on, we just have to discuss styling. What is this thing? How did this emerge from mid-2000s General Motors? In the front, you have this low-mounted body-colored grille with Chevy's distinctive silver line across the entire car. In back, there's that long, flat tonneau cover and circle brake lights mounted on those giant rear fenders. And can we talk about the fenders? They're huge, sticking out like eight inches beyond the body itself. This car looks like nothing else on the road, especially when it's purple. So those are all the unusual features and the cool quirks of the SSR. And now it's time to get this thing out on the road and find out what it's like to drive a pickup truck that's also a muscle car, that's also a two-seat roadster made by the same company who brought us the Lumina. All right, driving the SSR. Now, you might see an SSR logo back here. The owner of this car, Greg, he told me that that is actually an aftermarket piece that he put on. It's like a little wind deflector. So that doesn't count with the SSR logos that I mentioned before. Now, the stock exhaust on this thing sounds really nice and meaty. It sounds like it's really like a muscle car. Driving this thing around is rather interesting. First off, I like the fact that the windshield frame is shielding me from the sun right now. The windshield frame comes surprisingly far back. And uh, Greg, the owner, he told me that it, the result of that is that there's not actually a lot of wind rush on the highway. Um, when you have the, if you have the windows up and the windshield frames far back, you actually are kind of in a little bit of a cocoon here in your SSR. All right, driving this thing over these speed bumps, it's a little rough. <laughs> uh, the ride quality is, I mean, look, the thing is it's a pickup truck or it's a sports car, call it what you want. Neither of those things were focused on luxury and comfort. It's a wonderful experience being able to drive what is basically a bizarre work of art concept car. Whether you want to call it a beautiful work of art or an odd work of art, it is certainly more of a piece of art than a regular automobile. All right, I'm gonna give it some gas here. Woo! Oh man, listen to that. The transmission is uh, surprisingly smooth. It's actually surprisingly smooth for a GM vehicle from the 2000s, and the exhaust sounds really nice, but this isn't exactly the fastest vehicle on Earth. It's not slow, I would say, uh, but it's not exactly quick. I mean, you know, it's a 2000s pickup truck using existing parts. They weren't gonna make something crazy. I'd be interested in driving an LS2 to see what change or what effect the larger motor had, especially with the stick shift. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if the stick shift really had any uh, any effect over the four speed. There's an aftermarket backup camera with the aftermarket stereo system, which is very useful in this car because it's rather long back there and it's kind of hard to see precisely where it ends. I wonder how weird people think I am. When I see these on the road, I, I assume the driver is very weird and, and has some strange interests. SSR, buddy. The problem with the windshield frame being so tight over you is it does block access to the uh, you can't really see the stoplights, especially if you're my height. It kind of makes it difficult. When you go over a bump, there is some shake with the uh, windshield frame, the uh, dashboard, steering wheel, that sort of thing. Um, it doesn't, uh, it's not the most well put together car. A lot of the switch gear and stuff feels like a you know regular General Motors car. Everything is pretty reasonably laid out. The gauges are normal, fuel gauge, temperature, all that stuff. Nothing particularly unusual about that. There's a lot of purple. You can see the purple here. Uh, but there's also an entire unbroken line of purple going around the entire dashboard of this car. So the exterior color kind of makes its way in. The car is actually not as, as unusual or weird to drive as I was thinking it might be. Um, it drives a lot like, you know, like a convertible pickup truck you would think would. I mean, it doesn't, it's not, it's not incredibly fast. It doesn't handle incredibly well. Uh, the exhaust does sound nice. The seats are comfortable. There's enough room up here. Um, I think most of the weirdness of this car was in the style of it and all the stuff I just showed you, the trunk with the bed, I mean that stuff is so strange. 
Um, the actual driving experience, you know, General Motors had to use existing parts. So they used an existing powertrain, an existing transmission, a lot of existing switch gear and things like that. And so as a result, the driving experience is not substantially different than, you know, you'd expect in a, a lot of GM trucks, especially SUVs at that time. Yeah, there is a little bit of body roll and stuff through corners. I mean, it's not a sports car. It's actually kind of funny. Depending on your opinion, it's either a great combination of a sports car and a pickup truck, or it's not enough of either. Um, but if you're looking for, you know, a sports car that has more practicality, a sports car you can haul stuff, or a convertible that you can haul stuff, this is kind of your only choice. And if you're looking for a pickup that's like more fun and stuff, you don't have a lot of choices either. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that's the 2004 Chevrolet SSR, just your average, everyday Chevrolet pickup convertible muscle car thing. I figured if I spent the entire day with this car, I would have some idea what Chevrolet was thinking when they made it, but I'm still at a loss. And yet, there's a little part of me that kind of wants one. Okay, it's a big part of me. Anyway, on to the Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, this one is very controversial. Some people love these, but most car enthusiasts think this trunk is just a little too overstyled for its own good, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Acceleration, the early models with the smaller engine do 0 to 60 in 7.5 seconds, which, according to the Doug Score Acceleration Scale, earns it a 1 out of 10. Handling is fine, not great, a little below average, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Cool factor is a tough one. I personally think these are cool, and if I saw one of these at Cars and Coffee, I'd go check it out before yet another MG or stanced E46 M3, but there's a lot of disagreement here, since some people think these are earth-shatteringly uncool, so I'll compromise and give it a 6 out of 10. There's no compromise on importance, though. This thing is weird and interesting, but not significant to the car world, except that it probably helped accelerate the General Motors bankruptcy, and it gets just a 5 out of 10, bringing the total weekend score to just 20 out of 50, not so great. As for the daily categories, starting with features, the SSR was decent for its day, but it's outclassed by modern cars and it gets a 3 out of 10. Comfort is fine, the seats are nice, but the ride is a bit harsh and it gets a 5 out of 10. Quality is okay, the powertrain is dead reliable, but interior materials could use some improvement and it gets a 5 out of 10. As for practicality, the SSR's cargo area offers 23.7 cubic feet of space, which is ample and should earn it a 5, but two seats knocks that down to a 4 out of 10. Finally, there's value, and I gotta be honest, the average asking price for one of these on AutoTrader is 24 grand, which is insane. These hold their value shockingly well, and it's one of the most eye-catching vehicles on the road that isn't a supercar. It gets an easy seven out of 10, bringing the total daily category to 24 out of 50, right in the middle. Add it all up, and the total Doug score is 44 out of 100, not great. The truth is, in trying to be a sporty convertible and a pickup truck, the SSR fails at both. But the person I borrowed this SSR from likes it for the same reason I do. Not because it's earth-shatteringly awesome, like some SSR owners mistakenly believe, but because it's cool, weird, interesting, unique. It may not be a great pickup or a great sports car, but if you're sick of all cars looking the same with the same equipment and the same styling and the same colors, well, the SSR is the antidote with a tire inflator and a can of seal it in case you have a spare, and that's because this car, d in case you have a flat. There, thanks. <laughs> Maybe the craziest one on this little rubber part where the door links up to the... Hmm. And maybe the craziest one on this little... All right, driving the SSR, SSR. When you turn it on, it just uses the driver information center to say Chevrolet SSR in rather unassuming green print just so you remember what you're driving. I wonder if it says that in Illumina. All right, now as I've demonstrated for you, keep clicking. Keep clicking and I'll come in there and give you something to click about. <laughs> 